Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Maryland Health Care Commission, thank you all for joining today's lunch and learn webinar for federally qualified health centers. My name is Anene Oyabo, and I'm a program manager at the MHCC. The MHCC is an independent regulatory agency whose mission, among other things, is to plan for health system needs and promote informed decision making through a variety of initiatives. And this includes supporting and advancing innovations in care delivery that really focus on improving health outcomes and improving quality of care while reducing the cost of the healthcare system. So our um, focus of the webinar today is to provide you with some steps to enhance quality improvement in care delivery and we'll also highlight and share opportunities for FQHCs to become involved in advanced care delivery models. Uh, before we get started today, I'll just cover a few housekeeping items. So our webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website, that's the MHCC website, and a copy of the slides will be emailed to all participants. Uh, continued medical education credits will be offered for this webinar and we'll provide more information at the end of today's webinar. So at this time, all um, participants are in listen-only mode, and that's to limit any background noise during the presentation. We'll have a five-minute Q&A session following each presentation, and during that time, I'll unmute all participants so that you can ask questions. In order to be heard on this webinar, you have to enter in your unique audio PIN following the nine-digit access code, and you can find this audio PIN in the audio sessions of the GoToWebinar uh, menu. If you have questions during the presentation, please raise your hand using the hand icon in your GoToWebinar menu. And when we do unmute you, please be sure to not put us on hold and try to reduce or eliminate any background noise on your end. You can also type in questions during the presentation in the questions window, and we'll read those out loud to presenters during the Q&A. So that said, I'll lead up uh, today's presentation with a brief overview of some key benefits of uh, value-based care that will frame today's presentation. And Dr. Dan Morheim from Sinai Hospital will introduce some concepts that enhance care delivery and improve care quality. Dr. Haas from the Maryland Primary Care Program, Program Management Office, will provide some information about some opportunities and tools and resources available to FQHCs in the Maryland Primary Care Program. So the goals of uh, value-based care are really to improve health outcomes, care quality, reduce costs, and improve patient care experience. And implementing value-based care in an FQHC provides opportunities including greater flexibility to deliver patient-centered care in innovative ways, enabling better care management through access to better data, and earning financial incentives for achieving healthcare efficiencies. Transitioning to value-based care delivery models involves ongoing quality improvement activities, uh, care coordination, and a team-based care delivery model. Uh, the upcoming presentations are aimed at helping clinicians such as care managers, uh, physicians, and other healthcare workers at FQHC understand the value of advanced care delivery models and the available resources to improve quality, and care delivery under advanced care models. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Dan Morheim, who will dive into the details of quality care improvement. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Maryland Healthcare Commission, and thank you for listening in. I'm uh, Dr. Dan Morheim. I'm a uh, almost 40-year emergency medicine physician uh, in practice, and uh, Maryland State Legislator for 24 years, and you can see some of the other activities uh, that I am doing on this slide. But I will tell you this, I have been listening to quality talks most of my professional life, and I'm going to try to introduce some different concepts here rather than just be uh, another cheerleader to tell you that you need to do quality, which is something I think everybody already knows, and I'm going to try to offer you some uh, specifics. Um, as I go along, I, I will present a, a number of different concepts. The resource material for all of these, and there's my email at the bottom. It will be on the last slide as well. And if you want the source material, the articles, or the quotation sources for any of these, uh, please contact me. I'll be happy to send them because I can uh, provide those for any of the points. 
the first challenge I think that uh, you face and that we face in the emergency department is we are constantly uh, under pressure to report all kinds of things, some of which may actually relate to quality and some of which just relate to measurement. There's an interesting book I read recently called uh, The Tyranny of Metrics, and you might want to take a look at it. But one of the great challenges we all face is trying to manage social issues in a medical setting. Poverty, jobs, education, substance abuse. Now, sometimes the educational system faces the same challenges as the medical system, where students don't do well, but teachers are doing all they can. I think we do all we can uh, in the healthcare world, but we face some particularly serious problems. And one of them is uh, substance abuse, and that's one I want to focus on because I've seen so much of it. And, and the crisis that we're in is not an accident. It was a political decision uh, made in the Nixon administration, uh, and it got revealed in an interview later in 1994 by John Ehrlichman, and he pointed out that the war on drugs was really a plan to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and criminalize both heavily. And they did that, and it worked. And in fact, in a hearing in Annapolis, when I was in the legislature, I asked Baltimore County State's Attorney Scott Schellenberger how much crime in Baltimore County was due to drugs. He said, quote, upwards of 85%. And then I asked Major Byron Conaway of Baltimore City uh, Police, same question, he said 90%. And if you want to see them actually answer that online, I will send you the video uh, to prove it. So with 85 and 90% uh, of our, the social problems uh, that drive healthcare being related to drugs. The first bill I put in to increase addiction treatment was back in 1998. And, you know, we see it throughout the healthcare system uh, and also the criminal justice system. And clearly, in my opinion, at any rate, the war on drugs is an epic policy failure. After 70 years of it, we are no better off. And in fact, I can't think of one metric uh, that's better. Now, no one is for substance abuse, but putting people in jail has simply um, not worked. And some of this has led to overutilization of the emergency department. Now, my experience, and there are studies that people who come to the ED, very, very few really are there for nothing. Most are there for, almost all are there for something, whether we think it was a real emergency or not, they do. But one of the problems that I've noticed with uh, federally qualified health centers and also with the Maryland um, uh, Medicaid access is uh, they just don't have uh, availability of prompt appointments. You know, an emergency is uh, in your perspective. You slip on a banana peel, it's not a problem. You stub your toe, it's not a problem. I do it, it's an emergency that requires immediate care. So I think one of the things I would recommend is finding ways to be flexible with appointments when people are busy working and dealing with their families. And if you can accomplish that, I think you'll get more of your patients into your facilities and out of hours, which is really where that, a lot of that care ought to be uh, given. Uh, I was a department chair for 14 years, uh, first department chair of emergency medicine at Franklin Square Hospital way back when, and w we had a number of challenges uh, dealing with uh, community activities, whether it was nursing homes or managed care, or whatever, and one of the things that I would recommend you do is go coordinate with your emergency departments. We're really all on the same side, and uh, Coordinate with the hospitals and set up meetings with your local ED directors and nursing staff. Go visit them. Get to know each other and see what you can do on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, you'll find that uh, you'll, they'll be very responsive. Uh, CRISP tools are very helpful. And coming along uh, with the CRISP tools that you know about, like the PDMP, Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, uh, there will be uh, work to get the full medication list worked on by the Maryland Health Care Commission. You know, it's ironic that I can find out when I have a, medic, a patient in front of me in the ER that I can uh, find out their schedule two through five drugs that they're taking, but I don't know what blood pressure medicine, antibiotics, anticoagulants, and all sorts of other things that are vastly more common and often more clinically significant, and so we're going to do that. The other thing that I would recommend is um, we often report our metrics uh, as a collective, but actually it's individual uh, sit-downs are required. And when I was a department chair, we, we worked very hard on our uh, data, but what we also found when I talked to the entire department, and we became a six hospital group, so we had about 90 plus doctors and 30 others, uh, PAs and nurse practitioners, they, if I gave a general cheerleading uh, discussion about why it's important to complete charts and document, everybody would think, well, I'm doing it, it's not me. But in fact, it was individuals, but we all had our own individual gaps. 
Some doctors weren't very good at documenting the social history. Others wouldn't put in how the patient did over a period of time in the ER. I'll give you an example of an asthma patient. Comes in at noon, discharge at 5 p.m., nothing in between. There should be notes written 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, their status of improving, still wheezing, able to go home, discuss with family, discuss with private doctor. Sometimes just a few minutes of extra documentation makes a huge difference, medical legally, for communication, uh, for billing, or, or whatever. But you have to sit down, and we would pull 10, 15 charts for each doctor, me included, and I would be subject to this too. I didn't do anything to anybody that I didn't have to have done to me too. And we would go over their charts individually and see where the shortfalls were, rather than just sort of putting out general directives. Uh, now I'm going to move to a couple of specific issues that you may be tackling but may not have tackled in the past, and I would urge you to look at them. End of life care. Well, we divide in public health world the cohorts who has sickle cell disease, who has cancer, who has heart attacks, who has congestive heart failure. Everyone is in this cohort. And we do not complete collectively advanced directives. I know because I did the peer review published study. I'm happy to send it to you on that, which showed that only about 35 or 40 percent of Americans completed advanced directives, free, legal, straightforward forms, readily available, that offer some direction about care when you can't make decisions for yourself. And the percentage was much lower, 5 and 10 percent in the minority population. And we identified that as a minority health disparity in uh, the American Journal of Public Health. We need to introduce hospice and palliative care sooner. There's one thing I've heard about hospice. It's, uh, I wish I'd called it, wish I'd call hospice sooner. People are entitled to six months of uh, service in hospice. It's a difficult time, uh, and uh, they often only get uh, a month's worth of benefits. Our tendency has been, well, we can't do anything more for the patient. Let's throw in the towel and call hospice and palliative care, whereas the reality is they should be called sooner. There was a great study about palliative care from the New England Journal. To two groups of people with lung cancer, identical. Some got palliative care at the initiation, others later. The ones who got initially lived longer, spent less, and were more content and happier with their progress and outcome. So less money, happier patients, um, and so on. That's something to be uh, sought after. And so advanced directives reflect personal values, patients and families, and reduce unwanted and unnecessary medical expenses. I don't know about you, but I've been in the situation doing things to patients that were closer to torture than care for lack of completing free paperwork. So I want you to lead by example. Look around. If I could look around the room, I would ask for a show of hands and say, how many of you have completed advanced directives? And if you haven't, you ought to because you're a healthcare person who can look to you for that kind of leadership. So please uh, do that. I did write a book on the subject called The Better End, and there'll be a new version from Hopkins Press out this spring. But however you get to it, get to it. Uh, medical cannabis is uh, legal in uh, Maryland. Now, I understand there are restrictions and difficulties for federally qualified health patients, but nonetheless, you have to figure out ways to work with your patients because medical cannabis is now legal in uh, 33 states. I'm not talking about personal adult use here, but just the medical. And as one of the proponents of that, I certainly would have liked, uh, you know, comprehensive research to have been done. But as we as many of us know, and I hope you recognize, uh, full research into this plant, unlike every other plant that is in the world, uh, was simply uh, uh, shackled, and we never really got to do it. We're finally just getting underway. A lot of it's being done elsewhere in the world. There is an endocannabinoid system in our bodies, and if you go do look at the research of this, you'll see that more and more discoveries are coming, and there will be more. Uh, specific treatments out. And just to give you, it's not, most, most of us think about like uh, medical cannabis in relation to epilepsy or cancer. There's actually cannabinoids in our bones and there have been studies about maybe someday we'll have cannabinoids helping heal fractures. So someone could come to the ER with a broken bone and we might give them a splint or a cast in the usual stuff and then an appropriate cannabinoid. That's laboratory, that's not here yet, but to give you an example. We all want to be nice to patients. Uh, it's not just a good idea, but there is now studies called Compassionomics. I urge you to Google it. And uh, researchers have found that uh, when doctors and providers take just a few seconds, just how are you doing, I'm here with you, I'll stay with you, uh, good things happen in quality. That's the connection to quality. You can't read the fine print, but the leaders, leaders in Compassionomics are two Harvard doctors. Anthony Mazzarelli and Stephen Trigiak, 
Uh, there's a great TED talk by Dr. Tresiak, and he said how he's so hardcore data, but when he studied the data, they found that he helped monitor hemoglobin A1C improved, hospitalization improved, compliance with antihypertensives improved, just by the personal connection with patients. I try to do that in the ER where all my patients are strangers. I try to uh, get everybody there to in I introduce myself. I try to sit down in the room to indicate some presence. I try to get everybody in the room to say their name if there's family members around. And just those few seconds make a huge difference. But the other surprising thing is that burnout among providers, a real issue, goes down. But we're usually taught about how to man manage burnout is, well, go away from it. Your work is your work, but uh, go you know, take a hike, meditate, yoga, whatever, go for a jog, walk, play with your kids, listen to music. But actually, com being compassionate with patients actually protects health care providers from burnout. So something that many of us uh, suffer from or are affected by. I want to jump to another topic that's been overlooked, iron deficiency and anemia in pregnant women uh, and women in general. About 20% of uh, women in general are iron deficient, and 50% of pregnant women are iron deficient. Basically, the fetus sucks out uh, the iron. But now there are studies, I'll be happy to send these to you, that besides fatigue, less oxygen carrying capacity, anemia in early pregnancy is associated with those neurodevelopmental disorders that we are now seeing uh, increasing. We've taken anemia in women a little bit too casually, in my opinion. Hemoglobin of 10 uh, is not an emergency, but it should be 14 or 13 in most women. That's about a 25%, 30% reduction in red blood cells, which are the cells that we all know carry oxygen. And there are lots of personal anecdotes I can share with you of patients that I've referred for iron treatment. In the past, iron treatment has pretty much been oral iron, which a lot of people don't like for one reason or another. It takes a long time to work. We were taught in the past that intravenous iron was risky and dangerous. That is no longer the case. And in, in fact, uh, iron infusion is very safe, takes about an hour, fixes the problem, and uh, we can uh, help a lot of women feel a lot better, but also reduce uh, some of the challenges in early pregnancy. So go through all your patients. See who's a female between 14 and 70 who's got a hemoglobin of 10. Obviously, there are other causes of anemia, but the most common is iron deficient. Do the ferritin, do the studies, work it up, get them an iron infusion. You're going to see a lot happier patients and a lot healthier ones as well. And the last issue that I want to bring up has to do with physician maintenance of certification. Now, how does this relate to quality? It relates to quality because we physicians have to keep maintaining our board certification. It's, it's time consuming, it's money consuming, and it means we're not spending time doing the things we ought to do that help us learn other quality issues. And um, I first learned about this in an article in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, January 31st, 2015. And I felt the burden of taking these tests over and over again. Fortunately, I'm good at taking standardized tests. But as I pointed out before, there was no basis, there's nothing that shows that maintenance certification, repeat board certification tests among the 24 specialty boards are useful and relate to anything. It just relates to your ability to pass the test. So Dr. Paul Tierstein, a uh, famous cardiologist who basically developed uh, intraortic uh, heart valve replacement uh, through catheter placement rather than through open heart surgery. I got tired of taking cardiology boards and internal medicine boards. And uh, he wrote this article, and then we had a, a healthcare work group done, supervised by the Maryland Healthcare Commission. Uh, we found that hospitals had some concerns. One, they were concerned it would affect their joint commission status. That is not the case. Uh, they were concerned that it might affect insurance. That is not the case. The Department of Justice took a look at this. Uh, they believe that uh, this is a, a serious uh, situation. It may not be the most important issue in all of healthcare, but if you have to spend a week taking a course and a couple of thousand dollars, that's your CME money. And we'd like your CME money to go for that, which is actually helpful to you in your practice and enhances quality. And in fact, the Maryland Hospital Association, once they studied it, took a look and said they're going to work with MedKai to try to uh, address this problem. Dr. Pierstein stepped up and addressed this problem by forming the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons. I would urge you to join this. It's inexpensive. It's an alternative. More and more hospitals and health systems are turning to this as an alternative to the standard ABMS boards. Uh, in Maryland, Frederick Hospital and nearby Sibley and just over the border in D.C. now do this. I'll be doing a presentation for the LifeBridge system next month. But I urge you to take a look at this because 
Uh, this has got to be a way of uh, showing that you're a good doctor. And there's plenty of other ways. I know as an ER doctor, you and a federally qualified health center, every click, every interaction, every chart, everything you do is subject to review. And to be taking tests that have no uh, proven value is not the way when there's so many other ways to determine whether you're a quality physician or not. So those are some different approaches that I would urge you to look at. And if you want to get in touch with me, please do so. I'm also now chair of the Baltimore County Behavioral Health Advisory Council, which looks at mental health and substance abuse, and uh, would like your input on that as well. So thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions. Sorry to run down so many topics so quickly, but I wanted to share something different than what I think you usually get. Thank you so much for the great information, Dr. Morheim. <clears throat> we'll now um, open it up for questions and answers. Uh, Alana, do we have any questions in the line? So we do have um, one question I see. Uh, Dr. Morheim, um, can you highlight some best practices uh, for incorporating end-of-life care and advanced directives into primary care practice in FQHCs? That's a key question, and uh, there are a couple of things to do. But one is just recognize this is a difficult topic for everybody. We're human beings. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to think about for ourselves and our own family members. It's hard to bring up with your patients, and, and, and very few people are just going to embrace this whole concept on uh, listening to it one time. So you need to work it into the flow as if it's a regular thing. In my opinion, everybody over the age of 18 ought to complete an advanced directive. In fact, the three most famous cases in American legal history were women under 30, Suzanne Quinlan and Shibo, and it's much lower in the minority population. This ought to be normalized as routinely as we ask other questions about other things, and then it needs to be included in the medical record. There are a lot of challenges. People aren't comfortable filling them out. Clinicians aren't comfortable talking. They have to be made available. There are a number of ways to do that. I personally like an online system called mydirectives.com. But then when they are brought in, then we need to, uh, clinicians need to learn to honor them. I think this is going to be a shift over the next uh, five or ten years where it becomes more commonplace, just like we once saw a shift uh, where uh, on, on stopping smoking or kids in safety seats or wearing our seat belts or don't text and drive. Uh, but this is something that affects everybody. And by the way, it's about $300 billion of $800 billion of Medicare money is in the last month of life, carries over into Medicaid for their seniors and disabled and for private insurance. So there's huge fiscal implications as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Morheim. So we're going to go ahead and mute the lines. Alana, if anybody um, has a question to ask at this time, the lines are unmuted and you can ask that question. All right, so um, hearing no questions, uh, we're going to proceed to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Howard Haft uh, from the Maryland Primary Care Program. Dr. Haft, you're Thank unmuted. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this now this afternoon with um, this group, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, follow Dr. Morheim, and uh, he is indeed a difficult act to follow. It provides an enormous amount of information. And today we're going to focus in, in my portion of this presentation on um, the Maryland Primary Care Program. Next slide. Um, we'll do a brief introduction for those of you who may not be aware of it to the landscape of federally qualified health care centers in Maryland, and then a more detail on the Maryland Primary Care Program, what opportunity it uh, provides to federally qualified health care centers, and where we currently are in that process. Next slide. Um, so this is the broad, um, the broad picture for, for FQHCs in the state of Maryland. As, uh, as you can see, there's been a, an increase in the total number of patients served. That's about 5% or so of the total patients in all of Maryland. And of, of really significant importance that uh, the FQHCs serve um, both the uh, vulnerable, uh, the minority populations, and the uninsured to a disproportionate amount uh, compared to um, uh, other payers um, and, um, and are very significant in terms of the provision of Medicaid uh, care, particularly for those vulnerable populations. In terms of the Maryland Primary Care Program, on to the next slide, um, you can see that the Primary Care Program now is funded primarily from, um, from the federal government, from CMS and Medicare patients. Um, and, and although we often think of federally qualified healthcare centers as providing primarily care to Medicaid patients and the uninsured, there are very significant numbers of Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries uh, in addition, particularly dual eligibles. And the total number of 
Medicare beneficiaries and dual eligibles, that is those who are both Medicare and Medicaid, in the program you can see in the last box in this chart, which is 44,499. That's a very significant number. Um, so what, what is the Maryland Primary Care Program? The Maryland Primary Care Program is part of the overall total cost of care model, um, which is the umbrella um, model for, for what the state has entered into as a model to deliver better care at lower costs over the next decade. And particularly the Maryland Primary Care Program um, is focused on reducing um, the cost of care, per capita cost of care overall, Part A and Part B for our Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. But overall, beyond that, uh, improving the overall quality and utilization for all patients who are served in, a, in our primary care practices in the program and improving population health indicators and specifically in reducing unnecessary hospital and emergency department utilization. Hearkening back to what uh, Dr. Morheim commented on that um, emergency departments particularly are often overwhelmed with patients who are better cared for in an ambulatory setting. Next slide. So here's the big picture overall for the total cost of care model contract. It's all about in the center about improving health for Marylanders, but in order to do that, several things have to happen. And you can see in one of these circles, hospital PBR, that's the population-based revenue, where hospitals have committed over the next five and 10 years to reduce the overall hospital spending in the state. Um, and, and they're gonna do that using the hospital care redesign programs, which is a program that will allow hospitals to work uh, in creative and innovative ways with other partners outside of the hospital. Um, and then they're on the top of this circle, population health improvement credits, where the whole state has agreed that we are we are committed to improving the health of the population. And as we do that, we'll get credits back from the federal government um, as, we, as we improve better than other states. And the state has chosen uh, reducing the incidence of diabetes, that is keeping people from developing diabetes as the first of those demonstration projects. And underpinning all of this is the Maryland Primary Care Program, which pledges to build a strong um, primary care workforce for the entire state. Uh, it's built on the learnings of CPC and CPC Plus, and it's built to, built to fit into the uh, overall framework of the total cost of care model. And the test here really is whether or not by building a strong primary care workforce uh, focused on advanced primary care and all the things that I'll mention in a moment, can we actually reduce utilization and improve the health care, uh, reduce hospital utilization and improve the health of the, uh, of the population we serve? So the state has put into place the program management office um, to lead that charge. Um, how is Maryland Primary Care Program different from CPC Plus? Well, first, CPC Plus is an independent model, and, and this program is uh, part of the total cost of care model. In CPC Plus, there was a cap of number of practices. We have no limit. We, in fact, intend to enroll as many practices as we can in this program in Maryland. It's a Maryland-only program. It has five open enrollment periods. Um, in CPC Plus practices were either in Track 1, which is the beginner program, or Track 2. In this program, in Maryland Primary Care Program, practices can enter either in Track 1 or Track 2, but all need to move to advanced Track 2 uh, status within a three-year period, um, or they're not going to stay in the program, because we have, in our anticipation, only advanced primary care in the state in this particular program. Um, we've also included a number of features that don't exist anyplace else including the program management office and the state has supported care transformation organizations to help to help practices do this difficult transformation process. Um, we are now a, a multi-payer program also. So the next slide. Here's, here's what goes into the into producing an advanced primary care across the board in the state. There are these five advanced primary care functions that all practices have to achieve while they're in the program. And I'll go through these very quickly. One is uh, access and continuity. That's simply expanding access and creating alternative visits so that more access means less need to go to hospitals and emergency departments and more ability to see your own primary care provider. Next is care management, being able to uh, intelligently and using data risk stratify all of the patients in, the, uh, in your practice um, and provide appropriate care management for those who are the greatest need. 
uh, particularly in transitions of care when people are leaving the hospital and leaving the emergency department. Also, under comprehensiveness and coordination, being able to expand the offerings and much of this is already done in quali federally qualified healthcare centers, but not done in other settings. And that is particularly integrating behavioral health uh, into, the into the framework of every practice. Uh, and also screening for and attending to the social needs of patients, so social determinants of health, uh, which occurs with all the practices in, uh, in the Maryland Primary Care Program. And then doing patient family advisory councils, making sure we're always providing uh, patient-centered care, uh, and then using advanced uh, health information technology and continuous quality improvement. Um, those, are the, those are the things that go into it. What do we measure in this program to see what we find is success? Um, simple outcome measures, and we try and keep these very limited. Diabetes and hypertension control. Um, in 2019, uh, we also uh, measured, but uh, only for reporting purposes, screening and initiation of substance use uh, uh, treatment. So this is ESPERT, um, and we provided contractors to help practices, and well over 100 practices uh, implemented ESPERT. And this is because we're so concerned about the opioid crisis that we're in, we wanted to make sure that the state provided resources for that. And again, this was for reporting only, not for payment. Um, in the future, 2020, still to be determined, uh, but things like measuring BMI and weight management. And then patient satisfaction and utilization, how much compared to um, standards are we using hospital and emergency departments. Very generous payments are provided in the program as an incentive. Um, care management fees that range from $6 to $100 per beneficiary per month, paid in advance um, to the practices. Performance bonuses that range from $2.50 to $4 per beneficiary per month, paid in advance for a year. And then in track two, an advance track, uh, some additional um, increments on E&M payments of 10%, uh, and then the ability to get some of those as prepayment. Uh, all in all, it's a very significant investment, um, averaging somewhere around 60 to $70 million uh, uh, for this year uh, in our primary care practices. But we know this is difficult stuff to do. Transit, transformation, changing the way that you do things for many practices is, a, is an enormous challenge. So the program management office was established to help with those challenges. And they use, we use the establishment of care transformation organizations who share some of the care management fees on a voluntary basis from practices, uh, but establish kind of an economies of scale to help support transitions, to provide data analytics, and particularly to provide staffing uh, where practices might not be able to hire a care manager or a um, or someone is a community health worker or someone else who, who a small practice might have a challenge to getting part-time person, but a CTO can hire uh, those people with economies of scale over a broad swatch of practices that they might collaborate with. We also weighed in heavily with CRISP so that every practice has a, their own unique CRISP dashboard with the ability to facilitate the upload of quality measures to help with social determinant screening, to use query portals and event notification uh, in, a prevent, in, a, in a tool that's provided to every practice that allows them to risk stratify those individuals who um, are highly likely to unnecessarily go to the hospital or the emergency department. And then the state has also weighed in with contractors to provide for all the practices to help uh, implement um, things like behavioral health integration and SBIRT and optimize the use of their EMRs and and optimize billing and coding, um, but also uh, with staff and leadership training academies for practices staff and for the practice provider leadership um, to assist them in the in this transformational process. Also done together with uh, federal government and their Lewin contractor who are working in concert with us uh, on those issues. And then importantly, a team of coaches who go out into the field every day. Uh, working with practices and care transformation organizations and providing hands-on support uh, for all of the transformational things that need to be done, whether it's a logistical issue or whether it's something related to an actual care transformation requirement. Um, and, and they're proved to be invaluable for the, for the practices in developing trusted relationships. So those are the kinds of things in addition to the financial support that 
that we know we need to do in order to facilitate this rapid transformation. Here's an example of what that likelihood of available, avoidable hospital events tools looks like. This is what practices get once a month freshened up, and it simply lists those patients who are in their practice and the, and the likelihood of an avoidable hospital event, either hospital admission or ED visit in the next 30, 60, or 90 days. Um, that together with a whole host of other information is provided to the practices in terms of costs and utilization for specialists and hospitals and other services on, a, on an easily understood and digestible uh, fashion. Next slide. Here's what care transformation organizations provide. Uh, care coordination services, support for care transitions, data and analytics, standardized screening, things like SBIRT or PHQ2s or PHQ9s. Um, and they provide staffing for practices, including care managers, pharmacists, LCSWs, community health workers, and others. And they've, pr they've proven to be part of the fabric of this transformation that we're undergoing. Next slide. So here's what we have in program year one. We had 380 practices accepted into the program. That was out of 595 that applied, serving over 220,000 fee-for-service beneficiaries, more than 1,500 primary care providers, 40% of those employed by hospitals. As you can see here, care transformation organizations were selected by 78% of, uh, of the practices, so a very significant number. We anticipate that even in the second program year, that there'll be uh, this, about the same percentage, although we'll have more than 100 practices that have chosen to not use care transformation organizations and just go it on their own. They still are proving to be very, very important to the, to the program. Next slide. So here's what our current practices look like across the state. This doesn't represent the size of the practices, just their locations, and they're broadly represented across the state. We had an additional 150 practices that have applied um, for beginning in 2020. So we'll have nearly 500 practices um, when we finalize that at the beginning of the, at the end of this month. Um, but next slide will show you what happens when FQHCs join the program, if they're entered into it in 2021, it would fill in a lot of the uh, areas where we currently have deficiencies in primary care practices in the program, particularly on the, on the Eastern shore where we see a lot of practices. Next slide. Um, so why are, what are the opportunities for Maryland FQHCs? Number one is that um, all of us want to address the high-cost Medicare fee-for-service patients, including dual eligibles, and many, many of them are cared for, particularly in rural areas, uh, by the FQHCs. Um, allow, joining the program, if, if this proceeds, will allow the FQHCs to integrate into the broader primary care delivery system with all the supports and bells and whistles that we've, we've established there. It also enhances access to advanced primary care around the state, particularly in underserved and rural areas. It aligns the FQHC payments with the total cost of care model and provides the FQHCs with all of these state and CMMI tools and resources that they don't already have access to. And it provides a strong starting point for this journey that we're all on from volume to value. And, and HRSA, uh, who is intimately involved, obviously, with the FQHCs, is really excited about this possibility because an innovative model that doesn't exist any place else in any other state, but could be replicated if we're successful in other states if we are able to do this here. Next slide. So here's, here's where we are. We've already had initial work group meetings with our FQHC partners and CMMI through May, July, and actually into August and September. We submitted a written proposal, that is the uh, FQHCs together with uh, the state submitted a written proposal to CMS. CMS is currently reviewing that um, and if successful, uh, will include the um, FQHCs as able to apply to the MDPCP program in the RFA in, will be released in spring of uh, 2020. Uh, and FQHCs that apply would be evaluated the same as any other practices would be or programs, and they would start in January of 2021. This, of course, assumes CMS approval of the proposal. Next slide. And that's open it up for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Half. We're now going to uh, unmute the line. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, chime in at this point.
So we do have uh, one written question. Um, and if you have uh, more questions, uh, please feel free to jump in as we go along. Uh, so Dr. Haas, you mentioned the care coordination services and uh, practice transformation assistance CTOs provide. Um, how are CTOs paid for the support services they provide to practices? Can you uh, kind of elaborate more on that for our audience? care management fees um, based on this risk stratified um, enrollment of patients that they have. Um, practices can choose to affiliate with a care transformation organization. If they choose to affiliate with a care transformation organization, they then will choose what portion of their care management fees they would like to provide to the CTO. So they're paid from the practice. The actual payments come from from CMS, uh, but the practice decides at what level they want to share those care management fees. Again, it's voluntary. They don't need to do that, but if they want to work with a CTO, they would share. Currently, it's either a 30% share or a 50% share. 30% share would be a smaller amount of services. 50% share would be a larger amount of services that they would draw down. The, the CTOs... The CTOs also get a separate performance bonus, separate from the performance bonus that the practices get. And their ability to retain that performance bonus depends on how well the aggregate of their practices do during the course of the year. Thank you so much, Dr. Haas. So we do have a couple more questions from our attendees. I'm going to ask Alana uh, to go ahead and read this. Thank you. Our first question comes from Vivian Aguayo. She asks, where can we go to find out more about the FQHCs participating in the MDPCP program? So that's a great question. Um, we anticipate that if the um, process proceeds uh, with CMS, um, that there will be a release in, in the early spring of an or RFA, a request for applications. It will detail the specifics of the um, uh, of the uh, entrance of FQHCs into the into the Maryland Primary Care Program. Uh, in between then and now, I would suggest going to the um, submac, which is the uh, Mid Atlantic uh, uh, Health Association, um, who may have more interim details. Um, but the 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 clear defining moment would be the RFA released in the springtime. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, next question is from Melinda Maddox, who asks, is the proposal to CMS for FQHCs the same as the current MVPCP program, or what are the differences? So the, that's a great question. Um, and it, I would say it is um, largely aligned with the current MDPC program, MDPCP program. Um, however, we're um, not certain if there will be some interim adjustments or changes made um, to get better alignment within the overall framework of how um, FQHCs are currently compensated. Um, and and um, other than saying that it's, in, it's, it's currently in a high level of deliberation, uh, um, I can't um, provide any other uh, specifics on that. Um, but it would be, um, if we're successful, it would be uh, almost entirely completely aligned. Thank you. Our next question is from, from Francine Higgs Shipman, who asks, this is uh, from a previous MD, are physicians allowed to document and monitor use of medical marijuana in an FQHC? I think that's Dr. Omar. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't, I, thank you very much for your question. Everything that has to do with medical cannabis is in a state of flux and is by no means consistent, logical, or makes uh, entirely good sense. In fact, the federal, in the federal Congress, there was just a bipartisan bill passed that would, uh, in, in committee, in the House, both Republicans and Democrats voting for it. And by the way, in Maryland, it's always been a bipartisan issue, Democrats and Republicans supporting medical cannabis. And so uh, despite all the uh, dis disagreement in the House of Representatives, uh, the commi a committee did vote to uh, start to fix some of these problems, allow banking and so on. We'll see how it goes the rest of the way. But it was an overwhelming bipartisan vote. 
I'm, my understanding is this as far as federally qualified health centers. At the moment, you may not be a uh, recommended provi a provider who recommends care under the rules of the Maryland uh, cannabis program, not because of the cannabis program, but because of federal law. However, your patients, are, many of them are likely, one way or another, uh, participating because they can get care elsewhere. Um, when you go to a provider under the Maryland program, it's pretty well regulated what the provider must do, but it's not covered by insurance. So they're going to be paying out of pocket for that care and for the cannabis that they get. So um, I was really making the point that uh, you should do two things, in my opinion. One, lobby to change the federal law so that you can have the same tools that every other clinician offers to all their patients. And number two, be aware that your patients are likely uh, using it and probably is just a standard good documentation if they're willing to share that, uh, make the appropriate notes one way or another. But I think we'll find the world of medical cannabis continue to change and evolve both legally and medically uh, over the next uh, five or ten years considerably considering what was going on in the past. Thank you so much, Dr. Morhai. Okay, that's responsive to your question. So uh, we have one uh, more question for uh, Dr. Haft. Uh, Dr. Haft, uh, the question is, if CMS approves the proposal, how would an interested FQHC find application details for an announcement of the opportunity? Good, thank you. Good question again. So that would be listed on the um, CMMI website. There will be a listing, and now a notice and a listing of the RFA. Um, if it is uh, approved, we will well in advance of that uh, time and, and well in advance of that listing notify all of the uh, FQHCs in Maryland. Thank you very much, Dr. Haft. Um, we're going to let uh, folks have an opportunity to actually uh, ask questions uh, for a few more minutes. Um, so we'll go ahead and unmute the line. If anyone has any questions. All righty, uh, so here are no questions. Um, we look like we've covered everything for the day. I want to say thank you everyone for attending today's SQHC Launch and Learn webinar. We hope that you found this information uh, valuable. Um, as a reminder, we will be sending a copy of the webinar slides to everyone uh, via email after uh, today's webinar. And in that email, you'll find the link to a very brief uh, post-webinar questionnaire. We ask that you please take a couple of minutes to complete the questionnaire, and it would include information about obtaining CME credits for this webinar. Your responses are really helpful for us, and they help us to inform our future webinars and learning events. We're also really interested in hearing from you regarding topics that would be of interest for future uh, Lunch and Learn webinars. So thank you again to everyone, um, and have a wonderful afternoon.